Can the housing market handle higher interest rates? We all know the Fed is on a tightening cycle where they're supposed to raise rates maybe five, six, seven times this year. So will the housing bubble continue to inflate or will it blow up like we saw in 2008 during the GFC? I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the recent spike in mortgage rates. This is a chart only going back about four months to December. On the left, we go from 0% up to 4%. We can see that starting around December, interest rates around 27 2.5%, pretty steady until we get to February, and they, they really start to shoot up. Currently, mortgage rates are at 4.7%. And when I say mortgage rates, I'm talking about the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. That's up from 2.7%, so an increase of 2% in just four months. That's a really big deal. So why have interest rates gone from 2.7% up to 4%, or interest rates on mortgages, I should say? Well, first and foremost, the Fed just raised rates last week. They moved it from zero up to 25 basis points, or a quarter percent. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but relatively speaking, it is when the Fed has had interest rates at 0% since pretty much 2008, with the exception of about a year or two. And that's not all. The Fed is also tapering, which means they're doing less and less quantitative easing. What did they do during the process of quantitative easing? They bought mortgage-backed securities. So now they've tapered down to zero which means they aren't buying any more mortgage-backed securities. And if the Fed isn't there backstopping the market, those financial institutions that are issuing the loan are going to need a higher rate of interest because they're taking additional risk if they don't have the Fed there to flip those mortgages to. In addition to the Fed not buying any more mortgage-backed securities, we also have higher rates of inflation expectations. So as most of you know, the CPI went up to 7.5%. Now it's up to 7.9%. So again, those financial institutions that are issuing or buying the mortgage-backed securities in the first place, they're going to demand a higher risk premium. The higher risk premium, the higher the interest rate. So the next question becomes, well, how high will mortgages go? Well, let's think this through. The Fed funds rate usually follows the two-year treasury. And the two-year treasury right now is at 1.9%. So if Fed funds goes from 25 basis points up to, let's call it 2%, we would see mortgages most likely go from 4.7% up to 6.5%. Well, what does that do to buyers' purchasing power? Right now, if someone can afford a $2,000 mortgage payment at a 2.7% rate of interest, we'll go back to the mortgage rates you know, three, four months ago, they could afford a $400,000 house. But if we see interest rates go to 6.5%, and this assumes the Fed takes rates from 25 basis points to about 2%, and this is what the two-year treasury is predicting. Then that same person that could afford the $2,000 a month mortgage payment can only afford a $275,000 home instead of a $400,000 home. That is a massive decrease in their purchasing power and therefore a massive decrease in overall demand. Maybe said a better way, a decrease in demand for housing when home prices adjusted for inflation are at all-time highs, even higher today than they were in 2006 during the last housing bubble. And right about now, your friend and family member Fred is probably watching this video and saying, oh, George, you don't know what you're talking about. Housing demand isn't going to go down in the United States because everyone in Texas and Arizona, they're all paying for these houses with cash and therefore they don't even need a mortgage. Well, your friend and family member Fred has a pretty good point. 
But unfortunately, as usual, he hasn't really thought this through. Let's go to an example on the whiteboard. And we've got this bank who's going to give a loan to a qualified buyer. Everyone's favorite, Moody the Millennial, <laughs> with their blue hair. So Moody, of course, lives in California. And they want to buy a house from the average Jane. Moody works for Uber and Starbucks. So obviously, she got approved for a $1 million loan. So Jane's house just happens to be priced at $1 million. But let's back up a little bit. Jane was smart enough to buy this house in, let's say, 2012, 2013. But she works as a school teacher making $50,000 a year. So today, she isn't producing any more goods or services. None. But she is $750,000 wealthier. Let's just say that she hasn't made a mortgage payment, and now she's selling the house for $1 million. So the difference there is seven hundred and fifty dollars So Jane is getting the $1 million from Moody, who's getting the $1 million from the bank. And Moody is able to get that $1 million partially because interest rates are incredibly low. Let's say Moody went to the bank when they were 2.7%. So Jane takes the million dollars from Moody, pays off her loan, has a 750. Then she moves to Arizona because she's sick and tired of dealing with drug addicts and homeless people and Gavin Newsom. So she looks at the average Joe's house, which is way bigger than the house she had in California. And the average Joe is asking 750 grand. Well, that just happens to be how much money Jane has after receiving the million dollars from Moody that Moody got as a loan from the bank. So when Joe looks at Jane, he thinks that she is an all cash buyer. Wow, Jane is rich. She must have produced a tremendous amount of goods and services to have saved up $750,000 in cash. No, Jane didn't produce any more goods or services. It was just financial engineering. That's how she's got the 750 grand. But my point is that she wouldn't have had the cash to buy the house from Joe if Moody would not have been able to get the loan from the bank in the first place. At some level, mortgage rates will get high enough, and maybe that number is 6.5%, where all the cash buyers are gone, just like that. Step number two. Now let's go over the home price doom loop. To borrow a term from my good friend, Raul Paul, with real vision, it all starts by understanding that the US economy, or your income more specifically, really is dependent upon three things. 401k, i.e. the stock market, government deficit spending, and home prices. And you may be watching this video and saying, oh, George, that's nonsense. My income isn't dependent upon those three things. Really, let me ask you a question. What do you think would happen to your income or the business that pays you or your business if 401ks, the stock market, housing market went down by 50% and stayed there. Let's just say we go back to the GFC. Remember, housing prices went down by 50%. So did the stock market. And what happened to the unemployment rate? What happened to your disposable income? You say, well, it might not have been affected that much. Okay, well, let's just assume that those prices, those asset prices stayed that low for the next 10 or 15 years, like we saw in Japan, what would happen to your job? What would happen to your business, your income then? Obviously, for most of you watching this video, your income would be impacted tremendously. Let me illustrate this even further by going back to step one, the example we used of Moody the Millennial getting a loan from a bank for a million dollars to buy the home from the average Jane that she took the cash and bought the home from the average Joe. So Moody, like we said in step one, works at Starbucks. Okay, well, in order to get that loan from the bank, Moody has to have a down payment. This would be 
a result of the money she makes from her job. Okay, well, this makes a lot of sense. So Moody takes the money from the bank and takes the income from their job <laughs> for the down payment, and then they go and buy the house. Well, this increases asset prices. This increases real estate prices, more demand. And so what happens is the customers then have money to go to Starbucks. Then they give the money to Starbucks for their coffee, their latte, etc. And then Starbucks then has the money to pay Moody. And then again, Moody takes that money and uses it for a down payment on the house. But you see how incestuous this is. It all starts with asset prices and government deficit spending. If you don't have those three things, the customers don't have the money to give to Starbucks and Starbucks doesn't have the money to give to Moody and Moody doesn't have the money for the down payment to prop up the housing market in the first place and begin this cycle all over again. Now let's look at it through the lens specifically of mortgage rates. Let's say they go from 2.5% up to 6.5% like we discussed in step number one. Well, this takes us to the home price doom loop. So we've got home prices right at the top. If they go down as a result of interest rates going up, people are gonna have far less purchasing power. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of the cash out refis, and we can see that in 2021, they're getting very close to the same levels they were at in 2005 during the last round of this housing bubble insanity. But it doesn't stop there. If home prices go down, that means less purchasing power to go into the stock market to 401ks. So the stock market goes down and stocks going down can not only be a result of home prices going down, but also interest rates going up, just like we talked about in step number one. But then we also have a reduction in government spending. Now, I'm not saying that they're not going to deficit spend to the tune of, call it one, two trillion a year. They absolutely will. But they most likely won't deficit spend the same way they did in 2020 that gave people like Moody all of those stimmy checks that they could use as down payment to buy a house propping up the market in creating this, call it, trickle-down effect. So government spending goes down, overall purchasing power goes down. If overall purchasing power goes down, the home prices go down as well. We take us right back to the beginning of the doom loop or this feedback loop that takes asset prices lower and lower and lower. Let's just go over this one more time to make sure that we're all on the same page. So home prices go down. This means people have less equity to pull out in the cash out refi. This creates less purchasing power for stocks, which most likely would be going down anyway as a result of the interest rates going up. And we combine that with less government spending, which means overall there's far less purchasing power, which means home prices go down even further. Whoa, time out. Still have a hard time believing me that the US economy is dependent upon asset prices? Editor, go ahead and throw up this recent headline from an article in the Wall Street Journal. Last year in 2021, the average American made more on their home price increasing than they did at their job. Just let that sink in for a moment. I think everyone understands how the U.S. economy is really dependent on asset prices. But we can't forget about the government spending we talked about earlier. Look at this chart. It goes back to 2010 all the way to 2021. And this illustrates disposable income of the average American in the United States or an aggregate total of Americans in the United States. On the left, we go from $10 trillion all the way up to $20 trillion. So this blue line is the actual disposable income. The red line is kind of the trend. So we can see from 2010 to 2012, it was really kind of flatlined. Well, why was this? Let's think it through. Home prices went down in the United States from 2006 to 2012. So as you would expect, for the most part, the disposable income flatlined because our economy, even back then, was dependent upon asset prices. 
but just to a lesser degree than our economy is dependent upon asset prices today in 2022. So when housing prices started to quote unquote recover, we see this blue line going up at a steeper angle, which makes a lot of sense. But then we get to March of 2020, or call it April of 2020, and disposable income goes parabolic. Why was this? It was because of the STEMI checks. And then when the STEMI checks ran dry, then the disposable income goes right back down. Then we get another round of STEMI checks at the beginning of 2021, and the disposable income skyrockets again. But look at what has happened to disposable income since then. It's plummeted below its long-term trend line. So this chart would lead you to believe that unless the government continues to spend and unless asset prices continue to go parabolic, the disposable income is going to continue to go straight down. And again, if incomes go down, that means purchasing power is down. That means home prices are down, which takes us right back in to the home price doom loop. Step number three. So we discussed the demand side of the equation. Now let's focus on the supply side. I know many of you watching this video as I'm going through all of these variables that may lead to home prices going down. You're saying, oh, Jordan, none of that matters because the supply is so low that prices are never, ever, ever going to go down again, no matter how high interest rates are. Well, let's go ahead and think that through. Why is supply of housing stock so low right now? I think there's a lot of variables that go into it, but there's three main reasons. First and foremost, we have all of these financial institutions that are buying the residential homes, the starter homes. And I understand they might not be buying a huge percentage of the overall housing inventory, but you're not selling 100% of the inventory at all times. <laughs> Since you're only selling a small fraction of the inventory, if they are a buyer, then that's going to move the prices. It all happens at the margin, so they say. So we've got this character right in the middle. His name is Fat Cat Fink. You might be able to guess who he is because of my fantastic artistic ability, but Fat Cat Fink has two options. <laughs> He could buy all of these single family starter homes that let's say are under $300,000. He's going to make about a 4% return on that investment. Now, if the Fed has interest rates at 0% and a 10-year treasury is only yielding, let's say, 1.5 or 2%, then this might be a good deal. But if the Fed raises interest rates up to 2%, like the two-year treasury yield is predicting, you went over that in step number one, this could mean that Fat Cat Fink could buy a treasury for 5% instead of buying all of these houses and getting a 4% return. So which is he going to choose? Most likely, he's going to choose the treasuries for 5%. So how does he get the money to buy all those treasuries? He's got to sell all of the residential homes that he purchased. This would create a tremendous amount of supply, putting downward pressure on prices. Also, right now, there aren't many people that are just willing to sell. And this makes a lot of sense. Because why would you, if you saw your house as an ATM machine? If you had this asset that was just increasing in value every single year. And remember, human beings have a tendency towards recency bias. So we think whatever has happened in the last five years will happen indefinitely into the future. So if you're that person that's got an ATM machine that's been printing money over the last five years, you think it's going to print money for the next hundred years, would you want to sell it? Absolutely not. But what happens if interest rates get to a level where instead of this ATM paying you, you have to pay the ATM. It's sucking wealth away from you, not giving wealth to you. So then what happens is all of these people that don't want to sell their house because they think they're going to get rich, they say, oh my gosh, I have to sell my house or else I'm going to get poor. Again, this increases the supply side of the equation. And the third variable, which probably has the most impact, 
is the fact that builders just aren't creating new supply, especially at the low end of the market. Why? Because it isn't profitable with all the inflation, the additional restrictions, and government regulations. So if you go through your local town, I'm sure you probably see a lot of building with homes that are $800,000, $900,000, or maybe even these million-dollar McMansions. But you see very few, if any, houses being built that are these starter homes, the three-bedroom, two-bath, 1,500-square-foot house that you can buy for two hundred dollars or maybe $250,000. Those homes are not being built at all. And personally, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I can see number one and two changing very quickly. But number three, this takes a long, long time to bring more and more housing stock to the market to create that equilibrium where the demand doesn't outstrip the supply being created. But at a certain point, regardless of the supply restrictions, demand can decrease to a point where prices will still come down. Let's go over to these lines I drew on the whiteboard. This isn't a chart. This is just something I created out of thin air, <laughs> just something I was thinking about. So this black line represents interest rates. We start here where we are at 25 basis points or a quarter percent. We go up to 1% and then up to 2%. And again, this is what the two-year treasury yield is predicting. But then we go all the way up to 10%. This red line illustrates demand. And you would think that it would go down in a straight line as well, or at the same angle. But I don't think it will. If we go back to the doom loop we discussed in step number two, basically, it's asset prices go down, which results in purchasing power going down, which results in asset prices going down even further. So I think the Fed will raise interest rates until something breaks. But when it does break, again, to be clear, I don't think that demand continues to go down at the same angle. I think it drops off a cliff. The question then becomes, what level of interest will break the market? Another way to illustrate this is we've got some buyers right here. Let's say we have three buyers if mortgage rates are, call it 4.7% or Fed funds is 0.25%. And let's just assume for a moment we only have one house. This is our total housing stock. So if we have three buyers and only one house, well, the price is most likely going to go up. But if interest rates, let's say Fed funds, go to 1%, now all of a sudden, we only have two buyers. Because one of those buyers' income is no longer going to support the mortgage payment needed to buy this house. Well, we still have two buyers, and they're going to get in a bidding war, let's say, so prices still go up. But once we get up to 2%, now we've gone from having buyers to a buyer, <laughs> and they still may be able to afford this house. But you can see we get to a certain point, let's say interest rates are at 10%, therefore mortgage is at 15%. We're just taking it to an extreme. But at this level, we would have zero buyers. So if you don't have any buyers, but you still have supply, even if it's very, very low amounts of supply, prices are still going to come down. So to answer the question, can the housing market handle higher interest rates? My answer would be, it depends. Are we talking about higher interest rates at 1% or are we talking about higher interest rates at 10%? At some point along this line, the market has to break, which takes us into this doom loop. And right now, that line in the sand where everything breaks, according to the bond market, and the two-year treasury is 2%. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.